You remember Mickey Stevenson, I said. I've known him since he first began practicing being Barry Gordy. That's why they hate you, you Betty LeVette. That shit right there. You ain't had to say that, Betty LeVette. <laughs> his home. I saw his beautiful antiques and his amazing vinyl collection. He was a neat freak like I was. His pretty two-story house situated on a quiet tree-lined street had a big backyard with all sorts of greenery. By then, Kevin and I were getting closer and closer. Musically, culturally, and you guessed it, sexually. We were a perfect pair. Our only roadblock was Robert. If she can go to his house and his girlfriend not be there or th oh, it don't matter if his girlfriend's in shoes was at the front door and her, you know, bikini and, you know, pictures of her slathered all over the wall. If she wanted to crawl on top of the man, she would have crawled on top of him. I'm like, how did do Kevin manage that to bring Betty LeVette to his house? What do he do? Send his girlfriend on a trip? Other women have asked me, Betty, you've had all these men. You've gone from one to another, and yet I don't see any of them angry at you. I don't know. I've been lucky, and I've also been choosy. Aside from my first husband, the evil pimp who nearly killed me, and someone like Jean Chandler, I've gravitated towards men who've understood and accepted me for who I am. Of all those men, Robert Hodge turned out to be the most loving and gracious. So why didn't he deserve your loyalty? He wasn't happy when I told him that I had fallen for Kevin, but his devotion was so great that he stayed on to be part of my management team. His care for me overwhelmed his romantic attachment. Today, Robert remains my constant companion on the road. As if that wasn't enough, he and Kevin have become close friends. For that, I'm extremely grateful. Girl, they sitting around comparing notes on your pool. Kevin had a brainstorm. Country singer George Jones was to be one of the recipients of the 2008 Kennedy Center Honors. You know, that holds a special place in my heart because as a child, I actually performed at one of the Kennedy Center Honors. I had done what many considered a killer version of his choices on the scene of the crime. Maybe I could perform it at the Kennedy Center. My agent at Rosebud wrote Michael Stevens, the show's producer who looked me up on YouTube where he saw me singing Little Sparrow. That was enough to convince him. Slowly and proudly, I walked to center stage at the Kennedy Center. I felt confident in a slim, sleeveless maroon gown and matching maroon bejeweled earrings. I looked out in the audience. To my right was Aretha Franklin. To my left was Beyonce. Up in the box, I saw Barbara Streisand, one of the honorees. With my well-honed sense of competition, I saw these women as my rivals. Is this bitch nuts? They were colleagues. Aretha and Barbara were my contemporaries. These were women I had wanted to engage with for years. I wanted to demonstrate to them that I was their equal and then some. This was my chance to do just that. As I looked up, I saw tears on the face of Pete Townsend. I saw Barbara was spellbound. Aretha did not let me out of her sight. Girl, I know you are lunching. If you think for one second that Re was looking at you as competition, Beyonce held her breath.
There have also been moments of sweet revenge. Janie Bradford, who co-wrote Money, That's What I Want with Barry Gordy, is one of my only female friends from the Motown era. I must add Claudette Robinson, Smokey's first wife, to the list. Claudette is sweetness personified. I agree. I love me some Miss Claudette. I respect Miss Batty. Because she threw her shenanigans in this book for us to read. It's frustrating to read her. Because the delusion is, is choking me. I love you, Miss Betty. Miss Betty, I respect you for giving us this piece of treasure. This is a treasure, Miss Betty. Okay? It's just that, bruh. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You must have smoked something or did something in your past to make you believe that you did not need to be humble in, in, in the music business. It's, it's crazy to me. Janie I, was gracious enough to honor me at her yearly Heroes and Legends Banquet in Beverly Hills. All the old Motowners were in the grand ballroom, including the fattest cat of all, Barry Gordy. I walked out there proudly aware that of all the women my age, I was the only one who could still fit into an ultra felt size six gown that made me feel great. But you know what? Well, I don't understand how she got friends. It's because she alienates them. Why do you throw up in her, people's faces that you're still able and put it on paper, mind you. That you're still able to fit in a size six when as we get older, we all struggle with weight issues. But it's like she not even incorporating in the fact that if all you do is ingest alcohol, you ain't going to gain no weight. I'm just like, why does she do that? It's like you alienate your friends. The last time I see Janie Bradsford, she had gained a lot of weight. So now, And wait a minute now, Miss Claudette looking yeah so i don't know like i said betty levette might be a bit delusional that's supposed to be your friend but miss claudette looks yeah like miss claudette looked like she could be her and Smokey robinson's daughter oldest sister to me as far as looks miss betty i i don't know you be lunching i know i didn't read somewhere that you were not an attractive woman and you were not considered an attractive woman miss claudette on the other hand looks excellent now she looked like she might have had a stroke but she still looks beautiful i would never consider betty levette beautiful never i would say okay okay i mean she had her good days but i wouldn't you know like put her up on a pedestal and be like oh yeah she looks beautiful never it's like she crazy after accepting my statue on stage i settled in at the podium i spotted mickey stevenson in the audience you remember mickey stevenson i said i've known him since he first began practicing being barry gordy that's why they hate you girl that's why they hate you, Betty LeVette. That shit right there. You ain't had to say that, Betty LeVette. Why you do that? Why you so disrespectful? I'm sure everybody that was alive at the time during this situation in the Beverly Hills got Janie Bradford backstage and said, why the fuck did you bring that drunk bitch here? Why did you do that? Janie Bradford was probably like, okay, my bad, my bad. I ain't had nobody else to honor this year. Okay, here she comes. She was here. With she one barb, I paid him back for every disrespect and hurt he'd inflicted on me. I, I don't remember reading anything in this book that Mickey Stevenson did that was so disrespectful. I'm not saying he didn't disrespect you, but you better believe if Mickey Stevenson had an opportunity in his hand, do you know with that one, what is it, blurb, barb? He closed it. Fuck you, bitch. If I'm a hero at all, I continued, it's because I have a daughter who's an inner city school teacher in Detroit and two grandchildren in college. Okay. I respect that. And if I'm a legend at all, 
It's because I know people in Detroit who Barry Gordy still owes $50 to from when they worked with him on the Chrysler line. I'd like to say that people in this room helped to get me where I am, but they didn't. Okay, I'm here, I'm standing tall, and I'm going to sing you a song, a cappella. I sang, I do not want what I have not got, and got a standing ovation. Are you sure? Are you sure? I, I just can't see people in a standing ovation. If Mickey Stevenson or Barry Gordy's dumbass stood up for this lady. After I in the bar, G.C. Cameron, once a spinner and then a temptation, gave me news about Norman Whitfield, Motown's meanest producer. Norman's dead, said G.C. I looked him in the eye and uttered a one-word reply. Good. GC nearly fell off the bar stool. What's wrong with this lady? As I approach 67, I'm still not where I want to be, but I sure as hell ain't where I was. I love still champagne. There's a distinct possibility that like my parents, I objectively can be called an alcoholic. So also like my parents, I am a highly functioning one. My drive to succeed has not been stymied by my fondness for intoxicants. And if my singing has improved over the years, and I do believe it has, my dependence on wine and marijuana has done nothing to impede the progress. I'm going to smoke marijuana and drink until the doctors give me a death sentence. And even then, I may well continue smoking marijuana and drinking champagne. A friend recently said that he read a book about how sex can get better in old age. I don't buy that. No one has enjoyed sex more than I have. It's one of the primary pleasures of my life beginning when I was a teen. I'm so glad that I was free in an area where so many people are hung up. Along with cooking and singing, I've learned to fuck with the best of them. I have to say, though, that I don't have the energy I once did. Age will tire you out. I'm not about to give up my stubborn assertion that the church and its teachings can do more harm than good. If God wants to grab hold of me and convert me to his side, he knows where to find me. Finally, my ability to get up to perform in public without making a fool of myself is due principally to Jim Lewis, my professor in all things musical. I still value the lessons learned from other men, not only remarkable musicians like Rudy Robinson, but lover friends like Ted White, Clarence Paul, Don Gardner, and Grover Washington, who despite the complexities of our relationship, offered me genius care. In my lifetime, I've learned a hell of a lot more from pimps than preachers. Bitch! Preachers are pimps!
Oh,